began a series that I'll be running on straight one service after the other rather than this morning and next Sunday morning. We continue to be concerned about this nation. We ought to be from a perspective of what is right and wrong when it comes to salvation and moral matters. I hope for those who are in the auditorium pass on Sunday morning that we're benefiting from what the Bible has to say concerning civil government. But having said that, I think we need to understand that the problem, the root and ground and basis of our moral situation and spiritual situation in America is not in Washington, D.C. It's right where we are. It's in the home. It's in the individual's beliefs and conducts. Those activities there and in other public places only reflect what the individuals believe, and what they practice, and what they don't believe, what they practice. So I'm going to begin a study that will go for a while on divorce, remarriage, and the home. And I hope you'll follow with me. I hope you will take notes and write down any questions that you don't think were answered as fully as they ought to be or you didn't understand. And I'll try later on, the Lord willing, to clarify those things. Most of this sermon this morning is going to be setting forth some statistics regarding the state of marriage in the home. I'm going to ask you, just simply in your own personal experience, in your family, your extended family, at school, your neighbors, on the job, just what you know from, as we would say, first-hand experience, to consider these statistics and a lot of that as to the morals of this country as to where the problem really is located and what needs to be changed so as I say most of this sermon this morning will deal with some statistics and very significant statistics concerning divorce remarriage cohabitation and children of divorce first thing I would emphasize is that the government itself and other uh, social studies are now clearly declaring that we live in a non-nuclear society, and I'm not talking about radioactivity. Today in the United States, we're living in this non-nuclear society. Only about 35% of families, 35%, have biological children living with both biological parents. An estimated 65% of families today are either, and notice the list, single parent families, divorced, widowed, singles parents who never married, and singles who adopt. What's called blended families, adoptive families, foster families, cohabiting families. Grandparents raising grandchildren. All that comes from a survey done by an institution called Single Adult Ministry. In 1980, 45% of households consisted of married couples with children, biological family. In 1998, that percentage had fallen to 26%. That's from the General Social Survey of the National Opinion Research Center, University of Chicago. Now that's concerning the nature of families. Look at with me for a moment to some of these things concerning divorce. Almost 20 million Americans, about 9.9% .9 of the U.S. population, are currently divorced. And that's from 2006 your U.S. Bureau of Census. And this doesn't count those who have remarried. Single parent families rose to an all-time high in 2005, which now is 11 years ago, to 37% of families. Again, that's from the Census Bureau, 2006. Those claiming to be Christians, and we know how far that can go, 
divorce at virtually the same rate as the rest of the population. That's from the Barna Research Group. The divorce rate for remarried and what's called step family couples varies, but is at least 60%. Second marriages without children have a 60% rate of divorce and 73% of third marriages end in divorce. That's again from 2006 U.S. Bureau of Census. Almost 65% of remarriages end in divorce. Again, the Bureau of, of uh, Census Bureau and the National Health for Health uh, Statistics. 25% of all Americans have been divorced at some point. That goes back to 19, or rather 2008, and the Barner Research Group. The average marriage in America lasts only seven years, U.S. Census Bureau. Let's look at remarriage, statistics on that. About 75% of those who divorce will eventually remarry, most within two and one half years. That's from the Bureau of Census 2006. Estimated 1,300 new blended families are forming every day. 474,500 per year from the Bureau of Census. Over 50% of U.S. families are remarried or recoupled, cohabiting from the Bureau of Census. Now, more specifically, under cohabitation versus marriage. The probability of a first marriage ending in separation or divorce within five years is 20%. After 10 years, it's 33%. The probability of a premarital cohabitation breaking up within five years is 49%. After 10 years, it's 62%. Barnard Research Group, 2002. Then the children of divorce. 30 million children under the age of 13 are currently living with one biological parent and that parent's current spouse or partner. That's from the U.S. Census Bureau. I don't have the date on that. Boys raised in a single parent in single parent homes are about twice as likely and boys raised in step families three times as likely to have committed a crime that leads to incarceration by the time they reach the early 30s. And this is from a work called Why Marriage uh, Matters. Nearly 40% of children in our country will go to bed each night without their biological father in the home. And that's from a fellow by the name of Blankenhorn, Fatherless in America, 1995. And, of course, that's going back nearly 20 years. You can imagine today it hasn't got any better. It's gotten worse. One-third of all children entering step families were born to an unmarried mother rather than having divorced parents. National Survey of Families and Households. A person by the name of Wallerstein, in a book that she wrote, reports that only 45% of children do well after divorce. 41% are doing poorly, worried, underachieving, belittling, and often angry. 50% of the women and 30% of the men were still intensely angry with their former spouses. Most felt the lack of a template, a working model for a loving relationship between a man and a woman. Divorced parents provide less time, less discipline, and are less sensitive to the children as they are caught up in their own divorce and its aftermath. Many parents are unable to separate their needs from the children's needs. I, I, I want to really emphasize this part. Many parents are unable to separate their needs from their children's needs and often share too much of their personal life with their children, placing the children in a precarious emotional state, 
vulnerable to grandiosity, that's exaggerated emotions, or to depression within what is left of their families. The majority of parents of divorce are chronically disorganized and unable to parent effectively. As diminished parenting continues, it permanently disrupts the child's once normal emotional growth and functioning. The percentage of children who live with both biological parents who remain married has dropped from 73% in 1972 to 51.7% in 1998. That's from the General Social Survey of the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago. The value of children, as well as the values for, that is what's instilled in them, have been altered. Well, that's not hard to see. But now what's interesting is something you don't normally come across, and that is uh, corporate America's view of these things, because corporations exist for one reason, one reason only, to make money. And anything that's going to handicap them from making money is going to be closely scrutinized, and they have to have people working for them, and they're mindful of the mental status and emotional status of those people. U.S. corporations lose well over 10 billion, that's billion with a B, each year due to problems resulting from stepchildren and working parents and other forms of marital stress, according to workplace psychologists at Pace University in New York. Relationships between the children and parents and stepfamilies, which often include misunderstandings and unrealistic expectations, cause lost time, absenteeism, and lower productivity at work. This is a quote from Barry Miller, who is a counselor that deals strictly with stepchildren or stepfamilies. He goes ahead to say, and I quote, common as they are, divorced parents with a working stepparent or working live-in parent are not helped through normal family counseling. Now you have to think about that for a while. I trust that these statistics, though I know you're not going to remember all the details of them, will help us to understand how dramatically and extensively the home has come under attack. I ask you in the beginning before I read these, for you in your own life, your immediate family, your extended family, the people you know on the job, your neighbors, at school, wherever it might be, to think of those things you personally know as you read these statistics. And I venture to say that they balance out pretty well. You may, may not have known the numbers. A few more, a little more general, and they overlap with some of what I just said. But in 1993, and think how long ago that was, 2.3 million couples were married. In that same year, 1.3 million couples divorced. In 1993, the Bureau of Census projected that four out of ten first marriages will end in divorce. Seventy-five percent of women and 80 percent of men remarry within five years after divorce. Second marriages, and I think we've already seen this, are at greater risk of ending in divorce than first marriages. More people are part of second marriages today than first marriages. People between the ages of 25 and 39 make up 60% of all divorces. Over 1 million children are affected by divorce each year. 70% of all children born in 1980, and that's going back a while now. They're already adults, been adults for a while. But they would spend some time of their childhood in a single parent family. It's really been when things started really showing up the late 70s forward when a lot of these things began to, to really show up. And all these surveys have been done over and over again when it comes to this type of thing. I remember well when we lived in Tulsa and we left there in 85. This would have been about 1984. Jody was taking a class in elementary education at one of the universities close there. And uh, she pointed out one day after class that they said, now, if you really want a job and always have a job teaching, they said, just be prepared and get your education in the emotionally disturbed child. 
said they're going to be growing by leaps and bounds in the years to come. Well, that was 19, roughly 84. All you got to do is look around you. So I ask you in the beginning, this is the third time I've said it, from your own personal experience, your own personal involvement, and then these statistics concerning what's around us, uh, that we're in a mess. Folks, this is not Washington's fault. It's not Austin's fault. It's because the individual people have cut loose completely through whatever influence made them do it from what God Almighty in His Word has had to say about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And what we've seen in all of this, the Bible bears out plainly. When you take the smallest and largest or the smallest organized entity of a society, which is the home, and you tear it all to pieces... What do you think is going to happen to the whole society? What do you think is going to happen to everything in that society? All these people are going to grow up in these homes. They're going to go out. They're going to be a part of this, that, and the other. And they're going to reflect all this stuff we're seeing. No wonder there's a lack of maturity, a lack of emotional stability, a lack of judgment, of common sense as we call it. There's nothing there in the average home in America to give any kind of stability and anchor at all. Now, with all that before us, we'll take a little time and see where we get this morning. But I want to emphasize in the church of our Lord, the church is just defined in the New Testament. The church, if you're a genuine New Testament Christian, of which you are a member, as I said earlier in class, is expected to be the leavening for good in this world, to be the light of the world. To be the salt of the earth. That means by the way that we conduct our lives individually and in the marriages that are contracted and the way we raise our children is to be exemplary in the world around about us. But has the world gotten into the church? Has it gotten into the home? Do we not really know God's will concerning the very institution that he set up for the good of man. So if there's ever a need to restore anything as God would have it, it's marriage in the home. Do you think God takes lightly all this departure from the plan that he made for the good of man while on this earth? Certainly he doesn't. Do you think all these people are going to be brought into judgment in the light of God's good word on marriage, divorce, remarriage, and the conduct of the home? <coughs> Certainly it will. So we're taught by James and implied and taught elsewhere that we're not to be many teachers or masters, my brethren. And there's a reason for that, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. That's the heavier judgment. You can't teach what you don't know, and you better know the truth and know that you know it. And that better be what you teach and that for which you contend. And you better be willing to expose any and all error that goes against that. If not, we're just a part of the problem. We're not a part of the solution. The Lord's church has had plenty of false, deceiving doctrines arising from the inside of it. And the New Testament, written back in the first century, almost 2,000 years ago, is full of material warning the church then about that, even while the New Testament was being written. We've been plagued with supporters of false doctrines that have divided the body of Christ uh, so much in the time I've preached of a little over 50 years. There was trouble back in the first century while the New Testament was written and the church was just a few years old when false teachers rose up. And so much warning is there about them. More damage and destruction is often accomplished when men arise out of our own midst speaking perverse things because we still haven't learned, and I don't think a lot of us ever will, um, to judge all things, no matter whether it's in your family or anywhere else in the light of an objective standard by the word of truth. We still tend to say, well, I like him or I like her or, you know, they're all nice and, they'll, and therefore we base what's right or wrong or whatever we're going to do on what somebody said that we like. That just won't work. The results of traveling down the broad way, following all these false doctrines of every description, can only end in one place. 
And we're foolish not to understand that. And that's eternal destruction in a devil's hell. So Jesus taught in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. That's why we need to be... This is not a suggestion thing by Jesus. Say, well, it's better if you do this, but that's all right. You'll get to heaven if you don't. And that's the way most people take the Lord. In a false concept of love and mercy and grace. Folks, God's love gave us His Son and gave us His New Testament. God's mercy has granted to us a system that's called the perfect law of liberty that allows us the second chance and to be faithful to Him. God's favor is given to us when we adhere to the truth that sets us free, John 8, 31 and 32. There's no idea that says, well, you know, I'm a work in progress. I, if I never see that again, it'll make me so well. You know what that does? Well, I can dibble a dabble around in sin. I, he'll take care of it. The blood of Christ will continue it, uh, continue to cleanse me, and that, that's all. It makes me tolerate sin in my life. There's a sense in which I can define that a work in progress, but not the way most people use it. Because most people today, especially in the denominations and goofy brethren, tend to say, well, you know, that means uh, I can get by with this as long as I just don't do it too much. Well, it's just foreign to the truth. It means people aren't believing the Bible. It means they've got something else infiltrating them. Now, marriage, as God instituted it and is revealed on the pages of the Bible, is intended by God Almighty to have a noble and lofty purpose. You can be sure then the devil's going to attack it. And that's what he's done. He's been very successful at it. He certainly doesn't need to change his tactics. Marriage is a divine institution. Man better not tamper with it. Any more than the church or the plan of salvation or the way God wants to be worshipped by members of the church. It's designed so that man can be happy while he's on the earth. Well, listen, if these statistics that I read to you are anywhere near right, does that sound like happiness? Does that sound like a peaceful state? Does that sound like you would like to be in homes like that? They're worse. Do you say, well, a home is just a filling station, and that's all people have made it. Well, these things are worse than filling stations. At least you got filled when you're in a filling station. These things called homes today, are they don't favor at all with the Lord's description of the Word of God. People, even in the church, don't know the role of parents. They don't know the role of husbands. They don't know the role of wives, role of children. That's not being emphasized, as it ought to be. So I'll say again, do you think Washington's responsible for that, or Austin, or Houston, the mayor? Where's the problem on that? Is the church not teaching what it ought to? And above that and beyond that, it's the home not doing its job. Now blame that on your senator or the next president of the United States. It won't work. The people being elected to public office are simply a reflection of the people in this country. It's always been that way. Always will be. It's the nature of the situation. So I see people get all riled up about who's going to be what in the next. Fine, be concerned about it. But know that you can't change the wave of this country uh, from the standpoint of starting from the top down. Oh, you might kind of stay it off a little bit. But a politician is a politician is a politician. He's going to say to the masses what he thinks will get the most of them to vote for him and not the other fella. And they say, oh, that's not right. Well, you figure out how to get elected without doing that. You just figure it out. It's written. The Lord God said it is not good that man should be alone. Now think about that for a minute. When you read these statistics, it might be that you'd tell a young man or a young woman it may be a whole lot better that you don't try to get married in view of you who you've got to choose from. But as God wants it, it's not good that a man should be alone. He said, I will make him and help. Most of them say, help me. Nah, that's two words. I will make him and help. Meet for him. I will make him and help. Suitable for him. Genesis 2.18. That's a wonderful thing. God had all that in his mind for us. Don't you think we're spending a lot more time with the Bible understanding marriage and the home that's produced and making sure it's by the authority of God that we do what we do? 
Then we read, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. Now stop there for a moment. It's not the end of the sentence. Let's stop there for a moment. You can see Adam. All these animals come in before him. And don't try to think there are as many animals in as there are now. You've got to realize, even among dogs, most breeds of dogs have been developed since 1500s. So what the basic animals were that had the genetics in it that allowed them to continue to produce, produce everything we've got today, I, I don't know. But the point is, Adam, have you ever thought about this, what a genius he was? He calls all of these animals by their names. Gives them a name. Well, sometimes if you've got two or three kids, you can't even call all of them straight down the line, especially if you're getting on one of them, not calling everybody else, and pets too. But Adam, remember, at this time was not painted by sin. His brain was pure. What a mind he must have had. But then after all of this, he did all of this. You know, here's various animals. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet or suitable for him. Genesis 2, 19 through 20. Do you get the idea that God in his infinite wisdom is going to make a special deal here about the woman in marriage? That he does all of this relative to all the creation. And Adam is the head of all things. Does all this. But there's something like it. Now we're going to see Moses by inspiration focus in on the development of the home. And it's one of the most precious passages in the entire Bible relative to marriage. Is, and listen to it. Genesis 2, 21 through 24. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Again, Genesis 2, 21 through 24. And that's the record God had Moses write concerning the creation of the woman and why she was created and the attitude Adam had toward her as that suitable help that all the rest of creation could not provide. As God designed marriage, he made man the head of the woman. Now think how that has come under all sorts of slander, all sorts of attack. But that doesn't change the word of God. Paul wrote, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Now that's the order of things, 1 Corinthians 11.3. Man is to be the spiritual and physical leader in, in the home. And he rules out of love. He's concerned about this suitable help that he's so thankful for. He's concerned about the role that she plays. But then we also read Paul writing the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he's the savior of the body. We read again Paul writing to Timothy, the young preacher, that which he needed to know and needed to preach to the church. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. We know too that the husband is to love his wife enough to die for, that he should also love her as his own body, Ephesians 5, 25 and 28. And the wife is to love and submit to her husband, Ephesians 5, 22 and 20, uh, through 33. Of course we know that the Bible instructs us on how to do these things. 
But nevertheless, there it is. Now, do you think these things have been emphasized even in the Lord's church over the last 50 years like they ought to be? Do you think that uh, we sort of let the devil pull us to say, here's the problem when really right here. You see, I can't do a whole lot about a lot of things. But I can do my best as head of my house to have the attitude Joshua had as for me and my house we will serve the Lord. That has to be the way it is. That's the teaching of the truth. Oh, we'll stand accountable to God in the light of that truth someday when we stand before the judgment bar of God. We're going to look in a little while at Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to study that some more. But I want you to have this material because we'll have to hearken back to it. And we'll be repeating some things. Because the question the Pharisees asked of Jesus, Matthew 19, 3, was an attempt to trap him in the dispute that was occurring at that time over the interpretation of Moses' statement back in Deuteronomy 24, 1. We want to keep that in mind. You might want to go back and read Deuteronomy 24, 1. But now, I want to end the lesson this morning. Hopefully this emphasis will make, if it hasn't already, at least whet our appetite to go more into this and to realize the, the single important thing that can make a difference in this country that you can do something about and I can do something about. And you young people that are not married, you, you better set up and take notice. You better give a lot of prayer and consideration to the type of character, I don't care what he looks like or she looks like, the type of character that you're going to marry. And by the way, you will marry somebody you date. That's just all there is to it. You will marry somebody you date. So who are you going to date? That sort of lines you to the old movie that's been a remake on Ghostbusters. Who are you going to call? Well, you better call on the Lord in the light of His Word and let Him form your view of what you're going to do when it comes to choosing a mate for life. Because, you see, that person, will ever, He'll either help you go to heaven or she or not. And for somebody here that's not a Christian, you can't be the godly man or wife, husband or wife that you ought to, unless you become a Christian and give yourself to the truth of God and make your life over in the mold of truth that is the Bible, respecting God's will above and beyond anything else. You see, I don't know how to love my wife if I don't know how to love God and His commandments. I don't know how to love myself if I don't know how to love God and the commandments from my Creator who made me. And I am to love my neighbors myself. How can I do that if I don't know how to love myself? How can I love my wife as my own body if I don't even appreciate that? There's so much implied here in detail that the general explicits don't give us that a little thinking and study, which God expects us to do, would make a big difference. So as we journey into this study, I hope I've established one thing this morning. This is very serious. But it's something we can do something about. And we shouldn't get so concentrated on everything else which we may be <laughs> do little about when we can do a lot about this. Because you who have children, they're going to grow up and marry somebody. Oh, maybe they won't. Maybe they'll just live with them. Or maybe they'll be married with them for two or three years and divorce and go marry somebody else. You see, you don't think that way, but there's sure a whole lot of people doing it. And they come from a lot of times home just like yours. It's serious. It's critical. I simply ask you to respect the word of the living God when it comes to the very institution that he created for the good of man and be willing to sacrifice anything and everything in true sacrificial effort to be abiding by the truth. The other thing I would ask you to do is to become a Christian. And you can't become a Christian without believing in Christ. You can't become a Christian without obeying Him to repent of your sins. You must leave whatever is contrary to God's will and turn to Him with the full intent that you're going to live like He directs you to live the rest of your life. Confessing your faith in Him, Romans 10, 10, and being buried with the Lord in baptism. To be baptized and not repent is just getting wet. It, that's all it is. I don't, you might as well say, I don't believe in Christ, but baptize me for, in His name for the remission of sins. It won't work. And churches who have fallen away from the truth and who will baptize people who aren't qualified by the Scripture to be baptized are just throwing fuel on the fire. They're causing more trouble 
then they're helping because they're in disobedience to God. They're apostate, and they're going to go to torment when they die. If you're not a Christian, we've gone through the plan of salvation. You can be one today. If a child of God, you've wandered, you've gone back into sin, then repent of it. Turn loose of it. Quit it. Turn to God and throw yourself on His mercy, asking for forgiveness with the determination never to practice those sins anymore. God will forgive you. He's ready to forgive you if you will meet His terms of pardon, whether becoming a Christian or rededicating your life to the Lord. If you need to respond to the gospel, I hope you will while you have time. While together we stand and sing. scheduled for 1.30 this afternoon. 258, first verse only. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansion bright and blessed, He'll Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you so much for the 
ability, the chance that we have had to assemble here and to worship you in spirit and truth. We pray that that is so. Dear Lord, we pray for the those who have asked for our, our prayers and those that are are hurting in either physically illnesses or sadnesses of, of the heart. Dear Lord, we pray that you will comfort them as only you can. Go with us now, dear Lord, as we depart these premises and be with us and keep us from harm, if it be thy will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.